Okay, uh, I think we'll get started. Uh, so if everyone would take a seat. I uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so I'm actually surprised there's this many people here. That means you haven't gotten sick of my presentations yet, which uh, I'm flattered. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, as I'm sure most of you uh, am, uh, do know me, I'm Patrick Newman. And uh, the title of my talk is The Progressive Era in Crony Political and Local Reform. Okay. So what exactly will I be talking about? Uh, so I've given a couple talks on the Progressive Era uh, before. The Progressive Era was a book that I edited in 2017. It included a partially finished, uh, partially written manuscript by Murray Rothbard, nine chapters of a uh, planned book on the Progressive Era, as well as later essays. So uh, looking at his notes, when I was working through the manuscript, looking at his notes, as well as listening to his uh, audio lectures uh, on the topic, um, he planned for chapter 10 of the, uh, of the unfinished book, which he never got to, to talk about uh, crony political and local reform. All right. So he ended in chapter 9 sort of talking about the National Civic Federation uh, and various sorts of economic regulations that were being pushed during the Roosevelt uh, administration. Uh, instead, uh, he would move to, in chapter 10, uh, some topics that he spoke about in chapter 6 regarding politics and local reform. Uh, so a lot of measures that you've probably heard about that we'll go through when you hear about the progressive era, sort of the standard narrative. So we, you know, in terms of economic regulation, we often hear about with the progressive era, as you say, okay, this is the period when uh, the, the little guy was sort of rising up to regulate big business. Uh, you had all sorts of regulations that big business fought. Uh, this was all in the public interest and it benefited the public. You know, things like food regulation, banking regulation, the income tax, uh, the Federal Trade Commission, you know, all the things that we know and love at the Mises Institute uh, and so on. Uh, in politics, there's also sort of the similar narrative. So you, uh, you have sort of the crony um, political and local reform or just, you know, what Rothbard considers crony. Uh, but this is the reform that was supposedly to expand democracy, uh, improve the efficiency of government, uh, as well as, um, oh, all right, moving on here, uh, reduce uh, corruption. All right. So these are measures that I'll talk about, things regarding various ballot initiatives, direct election of senators, trying to reduce the power of the political machines, uh, and so on. So that's sort of the stated reform, uh, excuse, excuse me, the stated goals that you, you hear about. You say, all, right, all of this was to promote democracy, make it more egalitarian, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in reality, what Rothbard planned to do uh, as he planned to show how they were designed to decrease voter choice, uh, increase business control of the government, uh, as well as institutionalize corruption. OK, so the actual, you know, the, the real goals were almost the opposite of the stated goals. And the big thing here is that the whole progressive movement of expanding democracy was really a cunning uh, trick to sort of limit, uh, you know, democracy or limit actual control to certain people. OK. Uh, so this is what Rothbard uh, planned to write about in Chapter 10. Unfortunately, there's only notes in an audio recording. Uh, and in a paper of mine that was recently published in the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics, I sort of go through this. This will be the general theme of what I'll be talking about uh, in this presentation. So really kind of analyzing what Rothbard planned to discuss, which was he sort of incidentally men mentioned in the Progressive Era, uh, as well as some footnotes uh, that I have in that book as well. Okay, so... We'll break it up into either political reforms uh, or local reforms. So political reforms that we'll be talking about is various measures such as voter registration. So this is a period when voter registration requirements became a big thing, as well as the Australian secret ballot in the short ballot. So the Australian secret ballot we'll be talking about was instead you would, instead of bringing a ballot that your party gave to you, the political party, and you would publicly vote, it would be done in secret. The government would control the balloting process. You also had the short ballot, which was instead of voting on a long list of various uh, positions, so someone to be some sort of bureaucrat, you know, vote for someone to be some sort of mayor's assistant or, you know, bureaucrat or, you know, local, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, instead, the ballot will be limited. OK, uh, because it would be to make it easier for people to vote, um, easier to understand, et cetera. Referendums so the people could directly vote on an issue. Uh, political primaries. 
So you now had uh, the, the familiar process that uh, before the election, you basically have an election in an election where instead of the actual uh, parties voting on a candidate, say for president, uh, instead you had the people voting on who their nominee would be, and then they would square off against the other, uh, you know, the Democrat or the Republican Party. Uh, and most famously, the direct election of senators, uh, which was later the 17th Amendment, where before senators were actually elected by the respective state legislatures, uh, and now the people would vote on them directly, uh, much like a uh, congressman, you know, the House of Representatives. Right. So all of these, when you look at it at the outset, they they seem as if they're designed to expand uh, democracy, uh, improve voter choice, but we'll actually go through their sort of more uh, sinister and uh, nefarious uh, reasons behind those. Uh, and then you have local reforms. So you have various attacks or restrictions on political machines. So political machines, most famously, you have something like Tammany Hall, all right? Uh, the Democratic Party uh, in New York City. So these are these organizations. They were certainly corrupt, as we'll go through, and they had all they did all sorts of things, uh, you know, negative things. But they did have some uses. Uh, there were various attacks on political machines. You don't see political machines anymore. Uh, at least you just see the political parties themselves. Uh, the whole city council movement, which was to take various uh, positions and put it in some non-elected. Uh, council that would be run primarily by businesses as well as wealthier members of the community. Uh, in particular, schools. Uh, this was uh, happened in the school system, the public school system, which we'll talk about, as well as a fascinating uh, procedure uh, known as urban imperialism, which was actually where one city would literally take over another city. Okay, so something like New York City took over the independent city of Brooklyn. Uh, in the late 1890s, uh, you had Pittsburgh and Allegheny. Much earlier on, uh, before the Progressive Era, you had Philadelphia and uh, Germantown and so on. So this was actually one of the main ways cities grew, and this was all done in the name of efficiency. Uh, we're going to streamline things, reduce corruption, etc. cetera. Uh, instead, it was really just a, uh, a tax grab uh, as well to reduce the uh, political decentralization in various um, areas which we'll uh, talk about. So all very interesting things. These only sort of touch the, uh, you know, the surface of uh, a lot of the progressive era reforms um, that Rothbard planned to discuss, but it'll make for a good presentation, hopefully. Can't promise that, though. All right. So before we go on to the progressive era, we have to talk briefly about the change in the political environment. So you had uh, the one of the main, you know, uh, reasons behind the progressive era was you had the collapse of what was known as the third party system. So uh, American politics since the founding uh, was organized into what we consider various party systems. So the second party system was between the Democrats and the Whigs, right? The third party system was between the Democrats and the Republicans, uh, and that's the way it's been uh, since. So the third party system started roughly around the time of the Civil War in 1861, as well as right you know, all the way up to the Progressive Era, uh, was a period of fierce ideological and ethno-religious conflict with very high voter turnout. So what that meant was that people, you know, there, there were very um, visible ide ideological differences between the parties, okay, uh, particularly at the local level, and also generally your background, your, your ethno-religious background determined who you voted for, all right? So during this period, you could break up, uh, say you had the Irish Catholics, they were staunchly Democrat, you had various uh, native, what's known as uh, pietist, or you might say evangelical groups, uh, say as Baptists or Methodists, uh, at least in the North, they voted Republican, uh, German Lutherans voted Democrat, we'll talk about why uh, in a second. As well, as well as very high voter turnout, which we'll go through. So voter turnout uh, was extremely high during this period, and since the uh, fourth party system has been greatly uh, de decreased. So people really had an interest in uh, politics back then. And the main reason was because uh, parties basically took issues on the national level and sort of tried to attach them to the local level. So why people were always so interested in uh, parties back then, uh, you know, voting was because they were very concerned about local issues, particularly something like prohibition. So various religious groups that thought 
uh, alcohol consumption was okay, such as Catholics or various Lutheran uh, sects, tended to vote for the Democrats because they were anti-prohibition, versus those religious groups that thought alcohol, drinking alcohol was a sin, and if you wanted to get to heaven, you had to make sure other people didn't drink alcohol, and so on. Uh, then that meant you tended to vote for the uh, Republican Party. And they attached this to saying that, okay, just as uh, you know, the Republicans want to regulate your alcohol consumption, they also want to regulate uh, the, uh, the money supply as well as tariffs, et cetera. Okay? So for example, the German Lutherans, uh, they basically had two main voting um, you know, the planks, uh, you know, at least positions. One, uh, could they drink alcohol? Two, uh, which party supported the gold standard more? All right. It's not bad positions, in my opinion. Uh, so basically, whichever combination uh, Republicans or Democrats at the time appealed to them the most, uh, they would fiercely vote for them. All right. Uh, and that was a very cultural phenomenon. All right. So uh, you could break it down into Democrats uh, were really you know, controlled by the laissez-faire bourbons in the social socialist pi populists. Sort of a unusual coalition and have a whole lot of time to explain. The laissez-faire bourbons, so the party of, say, uh, Grover Cleveland in the Northeast, so they generally supported free markets, as well as the more populist groups in the South and West, so in the former uh, Confederate states, as well as the far out, you know, off mountain states where like five people live um, back then versus the Republicans who in general were more on average interventionist pietists, okay? So people were really concerned about voting. Voter turnout was very high, as I'll go through, et cetera. Um, so as Rothbard explains in Chapter 6 of the Progressive Era, after the Panic of 1893, basically the Democrats were in control of uh, the federal government at that time. And whenever you're in control of the government and a recession hits or a depression, uh, you generally lose. And the Bourbons were in control. And basically this was the time period when the populists took over. They kicked Grover Cleveland and the other Bourbon Democrats out of office. And this was really the beginning of when the Democrats were known as the more, you could say, uh, interventionist uh, party. So back then, you know, at that point, left wing still kind of referred to classical liberal. In that sense, now left, you know, since then, left wing refers to the left wing that we know uh, of highly interventionist, uh, et cetera. So with that, uh, you have the fourth party system because when the populists take over the Democratic Party, they secure control of the Democratic Party, but they basically only confine themselves to the South and West. So they're, in a sense, a minority party. They don't win any elections, all right, for the entire period. The presidential elections are always out of their grasp. The only reason Woodrow Wilson, a Democrat, won in 1912 was basically because the Republican Party split at that period. You had the Bull Moose Party of Theodore Roosevelt, and then you had the Republican Party of William Howard Taft. There's a whole, you know, all the whole story behind that and so on. The fourth party system is really the beginning of the modern political era because you have little ideological and ethno-religious conflict. And this is the beginning of when people say that, okay, both parties, they're kind of the same thing. I'm not really interested. Uh, I'm just going to sit out and not vote, okay? Uh, and then you have lo low voter turnout. And voter turnout declined at the beginning of the fourth party system, and it's kind of remained at that same level, as we'll see. Both parties were now sort of center statist, and there's less political emphasis on moral issues, okay? So tying things related to, say, prohibition on the moral, on the moral uh, emphasis, instead it became more of an uh, efficiency uh, aspect, et cetera, okay? So politics, in a sense, became secularized, and that was a reason why people were less interested in them, uh, in it. So uh, we talk about the fourth party system. You have Republican dominance. Democrats are a minor party. The collapse in ideological conflict basically leads to a large drop in voter turnout. Um, one aspect that people would always bring up, they say, oh, the real reason for the decline in voter turnout was you had a large amount of fraud. So if anyone's ever seen the movie Gangs of New York, uh, in the early 2000s, Martin Scorsese, there's this very famous scene where there, it's, you know, happened before the Civil War, but it was the same principle where uh, basically there's an election going on. You see a lot of fraud. People are voting twice or three times. You know, this guy goes up the one, he says, oh, I voted three times already. He says, oh, you call that doing your patriotic duty. Uh, and then they try to basically shave people to vote again, et cetera. Uh, that's actually was fairly insignificant. Uh, it wasn't really the main reason behind high voter turnout. 
So just to go through a couple of numbers, and I have a graph that sort of shows this more, 1896, turnout outside the South was about 80%, okay? And then in 20 years later, turnout outside the South was about 60%. And since then, it's basically hovered around 50 to 60%. So out of the eligible voters, people who registered to vote, uh, only around you know half, a little bit uh, above that, actually vote, okay? Where before, it was a much higher uh, percentage. So... This collapse in sort of the laissez-faire contingent, the Democratic Party, as I mentioned, the, the Bourbon Democrats, uh, and voter turnout, this what really is what created the power vacuum for sort of corporate elites, or you might say is big business, uh, big government, and court intellectuals to really take over uh, the political arena. So they would support regulations that would help them consolidate monopolies and prevent threatening regulation. Uh, as well as support reforms that would increase political control. So the first point is, you know, I've discussed this before. This is what Rothbard has spoke a lot about uh, in the actual book. Um, and then in chapter 10, what he planned to do and what he already, in a sense, what he talked about in some of the later essays in the book, uh, as well as a little bit in the chapters one to nine, uh, talk about how they supported reforms that would increase their own political control. So ironically, in the name of promoting democracy, they would work to restrict democracy and sort of consolidate um, their grip on the political system. All right. So you look at voter turnout. This is just a picture showing this. Uh, both presidential and midterms, you know, right around here is the third party system. And then right after the election of William Jennings Bryant, the populist in 1896, like it just falls and then it's kind of been there. This goes up to 2008, but it's basically kind of plateaued. And not only in the presidential era, but all, excuse me, presidential elections, but also in midterms and so on. So as we'll talk about, um, Rothbard, you know, in addition to this, he said one of the reasons for this was voter registration requirements. But the main reason uh, Rothbard uh, always wanted to talk about was ideology. Because actually in some of the mountain states, uh, voter turnout increased. In most of the voter registration requirements, et cetera, that was generally in urban areas. So for Rothbard, uh, the emphasis was always on ideology, where it was the beginning of, you know, why don't people vote now? You say, well, you know, neither the parties really appeal to me. They kind of say the same thing. I don't really see the need to and so on. Uh, that all began basically during the progressive era. Okay. So uh, when we talk about voter turnout, this was actually something that was deliberately intended by the progressives. So there's a great book that recently came out by Thomas Leonard. It's called The Liberal Reformers. And it discusses how the progressive, progressives were basically a bunch of elitist racists who uh, the reformers who actually, when push came to shove, they just wanted to have more control by themselves. So what Thomas Leonard says, this is a quote from him. He says, the progressive economists or certainly the most outspoken among them, were not egalitarians and never entertained the notion that expertise could work through the people. They were frank elitists who applauded the progressive era drop in voter participation and openly advocated voter quality over quantity. Fewer voters among the lower classes was not a cost, it was a benefit of reform. So they, the whole idea of the progressive uh, era is they basically said, the people cannot be in charge. They don't know how to take care of themselves. You got to give us the keys to the kingdom, basically. And of course, the only way you can sell that, if you're a politician saying, vote for me, you know, I'm going to restrict your choice, you're probably not going to win an election. Just like if you say, vote for me, I'm going to raise your taxes. Uh, it's really not going to work out. You have, to, you have to generally cloak it in some sort of uh, you know, intricate and elaborate sales pitch. So we get to progressive reforms. So when we talk about things like voter registration, this involved things such as poll taxes, uh, literacy requirements, citizenship laws, et cetera. The stated goal of these, which happened, really uh, picked up speed in the progressive era, was to reduce electoral fraud. The actual goal was to decrease voter participation of minorities. These minorities often voted for the Democrats, at least uh, before, back in the day. Uh, Republicans in the North attacked Southern and Eastern Europeans, which sort of the minorities they were trying to restrict. And Democrats in the South, uh, the populist Democrats, those Democrats that apparently were all sort of egalitarian and wanted to promote uh, you know, the common person, uh, generally attacked, uh, they, they, the goal was to restrict uh, the uh, uh, voting of blacks, okay? So you had, really the goal of all these registration requirements was to restrict 
uh, voting of minorities and really try and uh, increase the political power of various vested groups, okay? Mainly upper class uh, WASP um, uh, reformers, okay? So white Anglo-Saxon uh, Protestants, all right? Um, then when we go to say, we actually talk about the ballots. So before political parties actually distributed their ballots to reformers. So the voter, you used to carry the ballot to the poll, and then there's a long list of electable uh, positions that you would vote on, et cetera. The Australian secret ballot, which picked up around this time period, uh, and this is something that Rothbard uh, was at pains to emphasize, the government basically provided the ballot, okay? And the stated goal was that you would vote in secret, there'd be less voter intimidation, there'd be more transparency. The actual goal was basically to weaken the parties. Because no, they, they no longer actually had to provide ballots to voters, which would encourage people to go out and vote. You know, one of the ways they used to get people to vote is they said, hey, come and vote. Uh, we got some pork. We got some beer. It's a nice social event. Um, that actually sounds pretty fun. I would enjoy that. Instead, you know, a lot of that started to decline um, and so on. The actual goal weakened uh, parties, particularly third parties. Why? Because this is a problem that still is an issue for third parties, is if you want to get on the government ballot, you got to meet various eligibility requirements. If someone's name wants to be on a ticket, you got to have a certain amount of people who already, you know, express support for them, or you have to have certain registration uh, times and so on and so on. The short ballot was they basically had less elected positions. The ballot, in a sense, was shorter, not longer. And the stated goal was they say, okay, we want to reduce confusion and the difficulty of voting. Voting for all of these positions, it was difficult. Instead, you know, just let the government, uh, you know, choose and appoint most of these positions. Uh, you guys get a vote on, like, you know, uh, the local, you know, some, some local guy and the president and a couple congressmen and all that. And the actual goal, of course, is that, well, you entrench bureaucrats because it's always a pain to constantly try and basically be elected and you can remove yourself from control of the people, okay? So there's no coincidence that the uh, positions that were no longer voted on uh, benefited those people who are already in power because instead they would just have to get appointed uh, by the local city or state government for like 10 years or something, okay? Or even longer if uh, it's a civil service position. Various other reforms, such as the direct referendum, where people, not politicians, would directly vote on issues, as well as compulsory primaries. The people, not party conventions, would vote on candidate, or excuse me, would nominate candidates, as well as the direct election of senators, the uh, 17th Amendment, 1913, where people, not the state legislatures, would elect senators. So all of these, uh, what Rothbard said is, you know, he planned to describe as how the stated goal was to increase voter participation, because now you actually got to vote on, on, you know, more people, you got to participate in the primary, you got to choose your own senators directly, et cetera, and make everything more democratic. So in particular, these reforms are the ones that are always discussed in the uh, history class and so on. Uh, the actual goal is that they were to weaken these states Okay, because the state legislatures no longer decided on senators, uh, as well as the local political parties, okay, to benefit the, uh, the federal government, all right? Because what you did is you actually, as we'll talk about, when you have things, it's a very cunning uh, goal. It's a very cunning uh, task. And you, you, ma you make things more democratic. You give people more direct control. But what we actually do is you remove their control because you remove the vehicle in which they actually vote you know, where they can channel their political uh, concerns, which is the local party, okay? You know, we all move through basically uh, an intermediary, uh, and that's actually, you know, that's a more efficient way of getting things done. So in general, when it comes to politics, you know, most people are ignorant. You know, they don't know a whole lot about things, and they best represent themselves in small decentralized units, okay? So something like a local ward or a state party that really channels uh, their concerns, and then they can represent them. All right. And they represent them on the state level, which in turn represents them on the national level. So the goal of progressives was you basically weaken both the states and state parties, as well as local wards, which we'll talk about, in order to aggrandize power and restrict voters. So instead of the people going through the states and then to the national government, you have the people just go directly to the national government, in a sense. All right. And it's harder for people to decide things because they don't have a state 
uh, or a local party representing them. This weakens the local party, obviously. Uh, and then it makes it easier to control things on the federal level. Okay. You know, back in the day, when you belong to a political party, you belong to like the, uh, the Democratic Party of, you know, Tampa, right? Even though Tampa really wasn't a thing back then. Uh, that's just where I live right now, et cetera. And that was actually a thing. That was, that was a real like civic responsibility. You cared about that. You know, now state and local parties, they don't really matter. Okay. So this was actually something the Federalists, uh, what Rothbard talks about in the Constitutional Convention and Conceived in Liberty, they were able to do the exact same thing. They continually appealed to just the people instead of the states because the real goal was not to actually give the people more power. It was to increase the power of the federal government. OK, by making it harder for people to mobilize. OK, so really a uh, strategic plan, basically, uh, you know, quite cunning. Um, so we move on to, say, local reforms. Uh, the whole goal of the local reforms, and this was intertwined with political reforms, was to move political control away from sort of local wards. So local neighborhoods. Uh, and divisions of various cities uh, and towns, et cetera, which were generally controlled by the lower middle class as well as smaller businesses. Obviously, if you're poorer or if you're a smaller business, your political concerns are more local. Say, what's going to happen in this particular neighborhood of Philadelphia or New York, New York City? Not really the state of New York. Uh, and instead, take it to a more, much more centralized political control generally dominated by upper class or big business. Why? I mean, just think about it from the perspective of running an election or controlling politics. A, the, the higher up the election or politics, you have to have more money, okay? That naturally uh, makes it harder for uh, poorer people to compete, especially when there's various campaign financing laws, which kind of start around this time period. Uh, if other people can't donate to you, then, well, if, if you already have the most amount of money, the biggest war chest, you're going to be at uh, an innate advantage, okay? So the movement of political control away, there's also the movement of political control, excuse me, away from party machines, okay, which we'll talk about sort of these organizations that really represented people uh, and tried to instill them with an ideology and get them to vote. And instead, you quote, honest bureaucrats, politicians, and appointed commissions, all right? So the whole idea was to weaken the local and decentralized party uh, and instead just shift all of the control uh, on a more, much more centralized level. So again, the stated goal was to increase transparency and reduce corruption. So they'd say, uh, you know, local wards, they're corrupt. Local, you know, party machines, uh, they're corrupt, uh, which they were, but they did serve purposes, as we'll explain. Uh, and instead, just increase business control, particularly a larger business control, because they're the only ones who can compete on a uh, federal or a centralized level, uh, and also institutionalized co corruption, okay? So you say you're getting rid of certain forms of corruption, but instead you're basically just codifying it and preventing other people from competing with different forms of corruption, okay? Again, uh, quite a uh, smart strategy. Um, so a political machine, uh, so you see this is a classic example of a political machine, you know, at least the way it's portrayed. You have some guy, uh, usually he's, he's fat, he smokes a lot of cigars, um, and he's got his tentacles here, so he's, he's controlling the tax department where it says he's got blackmail, blackmail there, he's got the building department, uh, you know, it's very Standard Oil-esque, you know, the octopus, uh, basically, and, and this is sort, sort of... City Hall, and it says, for my own pocket all of the time, uh, and it's just controlling, and it's just strangling the people, and it's just this massive sort of leviathan that's taken over uh, a local area. Um, so that's usually the insinuation uh, that's, that's described. Uh, but in general, political machines, they got a lot of bad rap. Uh, you don't hear about them anymore for various reasons. Uh, but they were really just an organization to gather votes in ideologies while providing... Um, various, uh, that should be, um, you know, benefits uh, to supporters, okay? So it was a reason to get people involved in politics. You vote for us, we'll give you certain things such as patronage, uh, like jobs, et cetera. Um, and, you know, you know, we'll make you a loyal supporter of the, you know, the Democrat Party or the Republican Party and so on. So there's no doubt that they were corrupt. When they wanted to do things at the local level, they bribed people. They sometimes extorted people. 
Uh, you know, they gave out patronage, et cetera. Uh, a very famous, uh, you know, one of the ways in which they, uh, the machines used to raise money or political parties used to raise money was before, uh, if they would give you a job, such as patronage, you would have to basically contribute some of the money you earned back to the political party, okay? Then with the rise of the civil service, which became especially prominent in the 1880s, 1890s, in the progressive era, uh, it was harder to do that. So what they instead do is they engage in something known as frying the fat, uh, where they would go to a business, and the way I imagine it is you have some sort of party boss. If anyone's seen, like, the second Godfather movie, you know, they got the long coat. Of course, they don't have their sleeves through the actual coat. You know, it's sort of hanging out like there's some sort of mob boss. And they come there, and they say, well, uh, so you want uh, the tariff. Uh, you want to you keep having a high tariff on, you know, steel rails. Well, if you don't donate to us, you know, maybe we're going to actually support lower steel tariffs or the opposite, et cetera. So they would instead have get businesses to contribute to them, sort of like a form of extortion uh, and so on. Uh, so you fry the fat, you, you know, you put bacon uh, on a skillet and you want to get the grease flowing and all of that. That was the idea. You want to get the money flowing. Uh, this is actually still done. Uh, it's known as uh, milker bills uh, in today's world. Um, patronage, et cetera. But machines still had their purposes. Uh, so one, they increased voter turnout. They got people interested in politics. Uh, and they also had various quasi sort of private welfare systems. You know, you hear about the old story of the hot soup or the the turkey, you know, the, the, the Thanksgiving turkey dinner, et cetera. Uh, that was, wasn't perfectly private, but it was more voluntary. And this is a big reason why you didn't have welfare system, a government welfare system uh, at the state and local level, because the parties took care of you. OK, again, if you watch Gangs of New York, you have you see some there's a scene where a bunch of immigrants are coming off the docks and there are these guys sort of, you know, throwing them basically bread and they go vote Tammany, basically, you know, Tammany Hall. And that was the idea. So as Rothbard uh, describing one of his lectures, you know, he goes, well, you know, it's a lovable form of corruption, basically, you know. <laughs> so, uh, you know, everyone can like that. Um, now, there's no there's no surprise. You know, it's no coincidence that the party system was severely hurt during the New Deal of FDR. Why? Because instead of actually going to the party for some sort of quasi-private welfare system, you can just go to the government. Uh, they got you covered. Um, and then the last thing was actually a lot of the bribery was sort of defensive bribery to evade taxes and regulations. Uh, Rothbard had a great quote from H.L. Mencken, uh, who's, who's reminiscing about his father one time, and he was saying how he basically had to bribe a police officer to avoid certain regulations. And then uh, there was a reform movement, and he couldn't bribe the police officer anymore, and instead he had to pay a higher fee to the government each year. All right. So it was basically, instead of having defensive bribery, which is good, uh, you, you now lose that uh, opportunity. So, you know, for example, the Soviet Union basically survived on defensive bribery. OK, underground market bribery, you know, that was how the market basically worked uh, or how the country didn't just collapse back then. One of the one of the reasons. Um, so at least continuing on with this local reform, you have the city council movement, which is basically the emergence of these unelected uh, centralized boards. OK, uh, the stated goal was to efficiently manage cities. So instead of having the people directly elect the officials, the school superintendent, uh, various people on the board, you instead had them appointed by the mayor, okay, or someone in charge of, you know, the water supply or whatever, they would be appointed by the mayor. The actual goal uh, was not really to efficiently manage cities, or at least most of the time it wasn't. It was to aggrandize power, centralize power in the hands of business in the upper class, and in doing so, it would make it easier for them to obtain centralized contracts, franchises, so various forms of monopolies, tax assessments. All right, so not only lowering your tax bill, which is perfectly fine, but also, as we'll see, basically shifting the cost of payment onto other businesses, all right? So raising taxes on other businesses, as well as subsidies. So for example, you take a look at Pittsburgh, so major city in Western Pennsylvania, the state of Pennsylvania. In 1910, they had a 27-man city council in a 360-man localized, 360-man localized school boards, right? So local, uh, lower and middle class. So when you have a huge, you know, localized school boards, it means it's, again, school control is more at the localized level. You have a lot of representatives, et cetera. There's a new city charter and a school board system uh, that was passed in 1911, 
And now what do you have? Instead of the 27-man city council, you have the nine-man city council, okay? And quite crucially, instead of 360 people in the school boards, you only have a 15-man school board, which is predominantly dominated by the upper class, okay? So the idea here is you're basically taking control away from the lower and middle class to the upper class, right? You used to have 360 representatives, now you have 15, okay? 360, 15, right? Uh, that makes it, it greatly reduces basically the, uh, the control. All right. Uh, and there are various other similar sorts of reforms regarding education. In the book, uh, Rothbard talks about San Francisco. There's actually the fascinating situation. He spoke about this in a later essay, excuse me, in an earlier essay uh, about Oregon, where basically Oregon uh, passed a law in the early 1920s, uh, and this was still part of the progressive era, that basically made all private schools illegal. And uh, instead, you had to attend public schools. And the idea was you wanted to, you know, the, the goal was to weaken private schools, predominantly Catholic schools, um, and instead bring them all to a centralized public schools run more by Protestants. The group that was in charge of this back then uh, was none other than the Ku Klux Klan, um, who's the main sponsor behind the bill, because in Oregon, at least outside of the non-South, uh, the two groups who the Ku Klux Klan always railed against were, uh, were basically Catholics and Jews. So the idea was you're trying to Christianize the Catholics, take them out of their schools, and instead you got to bring them to the Catholic, uh, excuse me, the, the public schools. This was actually brought up to the Supreme Court. 1925 ruled that you can't do that. So they said you can force children to attend schools, but you cannot force them to attend only public schools. You have to at least give them an option, Okay famous uh, uh, court case, I think it was Pierce First Society of Sisters, something like that. Um, all right, uh, we move on. So you have, say, uh, urban imperialism. So this is a fascinating uh, uh, process. This is one of the most interesting things uh, Rothbard uh, dis you know, planned to discuss. Uh, he relied on uh, some various um, uh, scholars working in the 1960s on this. So urban imperialism was when large cities uh, would basically lobby state legislatures in the courts to annex uh, surrounding small, smaller cities. All right. So the stated goal was to basically improve the efficiency of the city government. They said, oh, you have all these cities. You have New York City right next to Brooklyn. Uh, you have all these, you know, you have uh, Pittsburgh right next to Allegheny uh, and so on. Well, instead, we just centralize it. We streamline the whole process. Whenever you're streamline, uh, you know, you always... Always, you know, when sure, you know, be a little suspicious. Um, because the actual goal was to, frankly, monopolize uh, political and economic power. So one, they wanted to crush, basically, the political power of the surrounding smaller cities. And they wanted to try and siphon off all the, uh, the large businesses in those areas to the downtown of the larger city. Okay? So the downtown is really the political power. And what they also wanted to do was instead they would, you know, without any control by the smaller city, they would go to the state legislator or the court, whatever. They would annex the city. Then you just happen to have new property, uh, you know, tax assessors come through and they say, oh, yeah, and all, you know, these new areas, we're now going to raise your taxes, okay, to benefit uh, the downtown. And this is where you got the increasing concentration of resources in downtown, right? So, for example, Pittsburgh in 1907, annexed Allegheny uh, and raised taxes to pay for Pittsburgh proper's large railroad debt. Okay, so they had a large amount of uh, railroad debt. The government, the the local government, subsidized it. They need to raise money. Well, what better way of raising taxes? You know, not on your particular constituents, but on someone else. Right. Um, in the Pittsburgh survey, so five years later, it said that the downtown businesses in residential areas paid two thirds the level of taxes of the surrounding areas. Okay, so you wonder why? Well, that was the whole goal all along, basically. So you instead, if you think about it, if you're paying a higher tax in the surrounding area, what are you going to do? Well, if you have the opportunity, you're going to move downtown. All right. So these cities themselves became more concentrated during this time period, and this was actually one of the main ways when you look at population uh, statistics in the Progressive Era. It says, oh, the population of cities went up. Well, the reason the population of New York City went up, one of the reasons was it was you know, just literally just taking over other cities. So it's not really, the population went up, don't get me wrong, but it's not as if, you know, you're, you, when you include, you know, Brooklyn, a whole new city, and it's obviously going to, uh, you know, increase the total, okay? And so many of the problems um, of, you know, um, 
uh, various urban uh, urban issues, say, you know, the uh, under uh, providing of municipal services and so on, overcrowding, uh, you know, filth, et cetera, that came from basically just undue concentration uh, due to basically uh, cities taking over other cities. OK, um, related to this is people would always say, oh, you know, it was good. We had the government take over municipal, you know, or various services like street provision, water provision. Uh, et cetera, because it was being underprovided by the market beforehand. Well, that in a sense is true. It was being underprovided. But uh, one of the main reasons it was being underprovided was because those uh, businesses were always under constant threat of the government taking them over. So it be basically created a self-fulfilling prophecy where you're not going to invest in a water uh, line uh, if some local uh, some local government is going to take it over and instead you know have some sort of price regulation where the price isn't high enough to cover costs and they're just trying to get votes. Okay, so and this is still a problem today in cities where uh, local governments, in order to win votes, they're going to intentionally uh, basically put a price ceiling on various services. So people will say, oh, wow, well, they're lowering the price of water, et cetera. You know, that's great. I'm going to keep voting for them. But in 20, 30 years, the whole system is basically uh, break, you know, breaking apart and, you know, uh, you know just, just crumbling. It's because, you know, the business, you know, wasn't investing in it because they weren't making money. Right. But that's 30 years from now. So the politicians now don't care about it uh, and so on as the story goes. So, you know, in conclusion, the stated goals of the political and local reforms were not usually the actual goals. In fact, very rarely they were. You know, there were some people who sort of bought into the whole story, but when you actually look at the motivations, you engage in the historical analysis, this is not the case. So during the progressive era, uh, in the name of expanding democracy and voter choice, democracy and voter choice were restricted. All right. So that's, that's good. Uh, in the name of reducing corruption, corruption was institutionalized. Okay, so there you go. Uh, and then in the name of increasing efficiency, businesses had more control over urban governments uh, and particularly larger businesses. So you had less uh, competition and things like that. So, you know, you also got that. Uh, so really, you know, the actual goals in a sense were very um, you know, antithetical or the, they were the opposite of the, uh, of the stated goals, okay? So some sort of uh, shameless self-promotion. Uh, I recently, there's an article published in the Quarterly Journal of Wall Street Economics about this, where I go through Rothbard's notes and some of his other uh, essays, and I go through these various reforms, because the whole movement Rothbard discussed was sort of taking government out of politics. So the idea was you would remove various functions from politics because our oh, politics is messy. The people can't, you know, the people don't know how to choose. And instead, you just institutionalize it. You shield it all from the public. OK, and this is really the beginning of the swamp that you hear about, you know, DC, you know, drain the swamp. You know, it's this whole mass of people who when you elect someone new, they can't get the other people out of office. It's sort of this ossified uh, structure. So there's that uh, paper. Uh, and then there's obviously Mary Rothbard's. Uh, the progressive era. Um, and uh, so I highly encourage you to read this book if you haven't done so already. Uh, and I think with that, I will end. So thank you very much. We good? Are we up? We have one minute. I guess if anyone has any questions. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to ask you one. So you always hear that debate about when the Democrats and Republicans switched, some say they never switched at all. Some say they switched during like Nixon Southern strategy, Dixiecrats. In my opinion, it kind of seems like the switch happened during the progressive era. What would you say? Yeah, no, I would agree with you in terms of the actual political parties themselves, like they're in terms of their belief systems. The Democrats, since the progressive era, became the much more interventionist party. In terms of regions, it's absolutely true that basically in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, before then, the Democrats... Uh, staunchly controlled the southern states. So uh, in many ways, they were sort of one party uh, system around that time period. Beginning in the 70s, you had the switch, where now you have basically the South uh, more Republican uh, and the North is more uh, Democrat. So you have both. But yeah, I agree with you that the actual, um, you know, the, the beginning of the switch, at least in terms of ideologies and belief systems, uh, occurred during the progressive era. Yeah. Uh, good question. Um, yeah. Are there more uh, Henry Rothbard resources that translate uh, the Polish Uh Well, there's always, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there, there's a bunch of that, yeah. 
uh, in terms of the the handwritten notes. It's more um, the notes are more interesting when they're not they're not actually like written out. Instead, it's 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 even uh, they're even more chicken scratch than the actual sort of the sentences, which is great. But yeah, there's there's a bunch of stuff actually, um, especially his class notes. Uh, there was a couple pages of the Progressive Era, some graphs and stuff that were sort of sandwiched between a stack of the class notes because he was just like, you know, I guess he wanted to teach and he was just, I'm going to grab them and then, you know, he just threw them in there. So, yeah, there's a whole uh, stuff, particularly history of thought, Progressive Era, economic history, uh, a bunch of his class notes as well as other research, research notes that aside from just reading the very insightful information, they're just very entertaining to look at. Uh, cause I can just imagine him teaching in front of a blackboard and he's literally got this crumbled up paper and, you know, he's just writing a bunch of stuff. And, uh, that's how we, that's what got me into teaching. Cause I wanted to do that, but yeah. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's, there's plenty of stuff, uh, in the archives. Uh, I think with that, I think we're, we're done. So if you have any more questions, you come up, if not, thank you very much for attending.